Thank you very much. Um, anyone who's looking for a seat, there's like the whole front row is free. It takes a certain something to come down to it, but um, please make yourselves comfortable. There's lots of seats at the front. Um, fabulous. So uh, my name is Carly Kremen. I am the Managing Director at DLPA. We are a leadership consultancy and we also work with organisations. Um, at the moment, a lot around solving some of the people uh, challenges that, that we're seeing on market. Fabulous. I'll switch through there. When we talk about resilience, it's something that I personally think has been uh, in the mix for a long time, but it's kind of rebranded through COVID. And it's become something that is really central in a lot of organisations, at least in what they're saying they prioritise at the moment. And there's a lot of uh, different reasons for why. Uh, resilience as a research subject really grew, got traction in the 80s, but really in psychiatry. Whereas now in the 2000s, we've seen a lot of research coming in in, in more the organisational context. So there's a few definitions around. I think it is uh, important to have a little bit of precision in what we mean when we talk about resilience. But generally, we take a version of uh, this definition up, which is um, resilience is the ability of an individual to bounce back from adversity, hardship and misfortune. For obvious reasons, that has become quite central to a lot of organisations through COVID and, and as we're coming into now, um, what is likely to be a little bit challenging from an economic standpoint. So we're actually seeing a lot in organisations that they're going back to kind of grassroots or uh, arguments around business cases and things because of, I don't want to say that the economic landscape has changed, but certainly the sentiment around the economic landscape has changed in recent times and people are getting um, more nervous about certain things. And um, resilience is really important from an organisation standpoint, so for an organisation to be uh, resilient. But what we're really pushing and what there is a growing body of evidence for is that by virtue of having resilient, highly resilient individuals within an organisation, actually some of those structural things um, become much more resilient as well. And I think that that is the really exciting thing in the wellness space at the moment, because we are getting that body of evidence. Um, you can get funding. And I think we can see here from our lovely full room um, that organisations are prioritising wellness. They are prioritising people. And so being able to articulate that linkage to get funding for the pro projects that you'd like to have, I think is a really important thing. This is um, a model that we use as a heap of models out there around resilience. So you can kind of pick the one that resonates the most for you. But we would use this one most commonly and we'd use it for an organization or for an individual. And you'd look at the different stages of resilience. So at first, at the bottom there of our triangle, we have survival. So that's where there is some form of trauma or um, stressful stimulus happening and you're just surviving it. So at an individual level, that's responding to a crisis for an organisation that might be going through things like we're having at the moment with increased um, insolvencies, for example, and, and some of the stress that's particularly in the construction industry. And you're in survival. Once the stimulus stops, so once whatever the crisis is stops, you would then come into recovery. And this is where you'd come back to the baseline that you had prior to the crisis. So um, in, the, in that uh, section of, of the triangle, that's where um, it's as, as you were before, you're not better off, you're not worse off. And that is where most organisations and most individuals stop. Where a lot of the, which is fine, by the way, a lot of people hear that as being wrong. That's fine. That's normal, right? Um, where a lot of the research money and a lot of organisations are putting their money in projects is in how to get into that thrive category. 
So what thrive means is that uh, following the crisis, you actually have taken on learnings and habits and different behaviours, which mean that your baseline is now higher than it was prior to the crisis. And it's organisations and individuals that do that well that we are seeing come uh, through the pandemic in a better position than they were before and actually be better equipped now to deal with some of the pressures we're seeing come up. And this is where a lot of organisations are putting their effort is in how to get the organisation generally, but their leadership teams into that thriving stage. One thing I do want to flag about this model and why scientific construct is quite important is that people generally are really, really bad at self-assessment particularly when we talk about resilience. People tend to either grossly overestimate or grossly underestimate. So when you're looking at um, doing these assessments, it is important to have quite a robust framework around how you're going to measure that, about what the behaviours are, because people almost always identify themselves as being in thriving. I think that's part of the languaging around it that it sounds like if you're not thriving, you must be failing. And so therefore, obviously I select that I'm thriving. Um, but just having a bit of a, uh, a scientific construct around how we define those things is, is really important. And remembering that people by and large are, are very poor at self-assessment. We know that in that thrive category, there's about, it depends which study you go with, there's between five and 15% of the population sit there naturally. And uh, then with a, a few tools and, uh, tools and tricks, I should say, you can um, get a, a substantial percentage more up into there. there but we also, on, on balance, think it's probable that there's a large percentage of the population who will never get into thriving. That it's just not, um, it's just not in the capability. And again, that's not wrong. It's just that it's not in the capability that the more normal thing is that you do survival, recovery, same baseline. In each of those stages, there's different things that you can do to, to support people and to make it more likely that people are going to thrive. Not everybody is going to thrive, but you can make it more likely that they will. So in surviving, that's where we'd have things like self-care, physical rituals, so that can be um, things like uh, power posing that Amy Cuddy does. It can be very simple things like washing your hands and having running water for um, vagal response, for, for anxiety response. Snapshots and postcards, which is a meditation technique. Um, which can be a wonderful thing for dealing, uh, it's uh, used a lot with um, trauma survivors, but uh, it, it's actually a valid thing for anyone who's dealing with normal life stresses as well. And a de-trigger, so that can be like Russ Harris's unhooking, uh, Brené Brown has the three R's, there's a lot of de-triggers on market. Um, but that's a really important one for surviving. Then we come into recovering, and again, this is where um, the vast majority of the population stay. So this, this is a really valid thing to have um, emphasis on as an organisation as well. So we've got the GEM principle, so that's um, been made famous by the Resilience Project and Hugh van Kylenberg. Um, so that's gratitude, empathy and mindfulness. Boundaries, and that can be like behavioural boundaries around, um, you know, charters within your organisation about how you're going to interact, but it can also be around personal boundaries. So things like, I'm not going to check my email at 6am when I wake up in bed, I'm going to at least wait till I've had breakfast. Um, and just having those sorts of boundaries around making sure that you are protecting yourself and putting yourself in the best stead to, to move forward powerfully. Values alignment, also um, very important that having that alignment between your core values, so what, what really are your core beliefs and, and your why, and your organisation or your lived reality is really important as well. We know that when they are not aligned, people experience quite a lot of stress. 
and um, making sure that there is that alignment is, is a great way to uh, manage stress as well. And stress management frameworks we're seeing come in more uh, into organisations now. I think there's quite a few talks over the next um, two days which will touch on elements of these frameworks. Um, so really encourage you to have a look at those as well. Um, and the, I think that the stress management frameworks is something that can sound more complicated than it is as well, which I think is what's great about some of the talks we're going to have over the next few days, that they're going to be quite uh, practical around things that you can take back into your organisations and do straight away. So then thriving, um, where we'd work with individuals to be able to, again, make it more likely, recognising that not everyone is going to get there. Um, make it more likely that they move into thriving. We'd look at things like uh, mindset management. So again, Brené Brown has a lot in that space, Russ Harris, um, the Positivity Institute and the Happiness Institute in the States, um, the Wellbeing Project in the UK and indeed the Resilience Project here. There's a lot um, in, that, in that space that you can do. There's a lot free available um, that you can implement straight into your organisation if you want to, or you can do more tailored stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me. Reflection and awareness, that's awareness of self and others. I'm not, I, I, I put a really big caution around doing things like empathy training. Um, that I, I have seen versions of empathy training work, but um, I've seen more versions not work and, and that it, it can actually make things quite a bit worse if you, if you don't quite nail that. So that's kind of my caution in the thriving of when people talk about awareness of others, they tend to gravitate towards um, empathy training, which uh, my belief is more that you focus on developing other skills and empathy comes rather than trying to make people empathetic, which I'm, I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure is, is, is the best use of time. Um, personal growth, fostering curiosity, and uh, also positive psychology. So using positive psychology within uh, your organisations can have a real shift on the overall resilience of your work group. Um, and just shifting that focus, particularly because, you know, anyone who's watched the news this morning or last week, um, at any point in time, really, over the last five to ten years, uh, will be aware that the narrative is overwhelmingly negative. And so we are just bombarded constantly with these negative messages that we train our brains to then scan for negative things. And so that's where positive psychology is really useful for retraining our brain to stop that and actually scan for the positive things, which there are plenty of, it's just that we overlook them because of, you know, very various factors that, that are at play in our worlds. <clears throat> when we talk about resilient organisations, historically we've been talking about things like exposure to debt, so debt ratios. We've been talking about um, product pricing strategies. We've been talking about market share, structural things. There, there is a shift now, which I find really exciting because I think it's, um, you can have a lot more impact by focusing on the people element and that it is inherently linked to the re resilience of an organisation. So in 2021, Deloitte released a global resilience report, which I think was great. They, um, well, it had mixed funding, but they put some funding into that. and. It had some great findings. I'd recommend, if, if, you're, if it's an area of interest for you, I'd recommend you Google it. It's, um, it's freely available and it's an excellent report. But they found that a resilient organisation, the structural stuff was important, but they had five key factors. And those factors were that they were prepared so that the organisations had considered that there were multiple possible futures that their change was inherently present in the marketplace and that they were going to need to adapt. They were prepared for multiple outcomes. They were adaptable, so they had flexibility um, within, within the organisation. They didn't have very rigid structures that would prevent change or, or be a roadblock to change. They were adaptable. They were collaborative, so they had 
structures to allow information to flow, for ideas to be shared, um, and for people to truly work together and actually come up with those multifunctional team ideas and, and processes. Interestingly, they were trustworthy, and I think that this report was the first time that really came into talking about organisation resilience, um, but that they were trustworthy, that there was valid reasons for people when they were interacting with that organisation to believe what they were being told, that they had that credibility. And finally, that they were responsible, so that they were um, accountable for their actions and that the people within them were those things as well. Now, when this report came out, it um, ha had a bit of a stalled start, but then it, it got a lot of momentum in the market. And part of why is because you can quickly identify that actually the key for an organisation becoming those things is for them to focus on allowing their people or key people within their organisation to become those things. So that's where we talk about the correlation between uh, the people in an organisation and their resilience and the resilience of the organisation overall. So correlation just means the degree to which two things are related. And this is where your access point is for funding. If any of you are trying to talk to um, whoever it is in your organisation who holds the money, it's this correlation that gives you access to money to really focus on people. And the, the reason for that is that resilient leaders tend to create structures and behavioural standards that develop the capability of the whole team and go beyond reactionary change. So we know if we are strategic with putting uh, highly resilient leaders in that they tend to build structures and behaviours that make organisations perform more strongly in those five categories. Then if you couple that, so you've got your strong and resilient leadership team, if you uh, couple that with the cross-team functionality and process management, so meaning that you have those structures in place to A, be more collaborative as an organisation, but B, have the resilience of those key leaders actually transfer into other areas of your business and not be siloed. Um, we know that that's when you start to have broad cultural change. And once you have the cultural change and that culture to support these things in an organisation, you're not as beholden to key individuals um, because it's, the, the culture takes a, a, a bit longer to change. And the really uh, key thing that I would, would point out is that we, we are seeing now more and more data around the average resilience scores of the whole work group and team going up where you have highly resilient leaders at strategic points in your business. And so this is the, the real key bit of any business case that you want to talk about these projects is that you don't have to focus on every single person in your organisation straight up, that you can be very strategic and look at your processes and your um, org chart and really select people who are going to have the most impact. My personal view is that these types of change projects, if you're looking at building resilience, should be self-funding within a 12-month period. And that by doing that and focusing on key individuals, the whole resilience score of your work group should go up and that you, you can then have funding and a little bit of momentum to deal with the, the, the broader group as well and provide opportunities to your broader group just through that little bit of strategy, which I think is really exciting and there's a lot of um, data coming into that space, which uh, I think watch this space as, as we get more of it, but uh, super, super exciting. 
So I have a clock flashing at me, which tells me I'm out of time. Um, thank you so much for, for listening, and I hope there was something of value in there. Enjoy the conference. I think people say it a lot, but it is so exciting to be back face to face and sharing ideas. I think that these conferences and talking things through are where change, meaningful change really happens and exciting new ideas really happen. So make sure you connect with everyone. Don't just sit with the people you came with and have a wonderful conference.